Board of Public Works, uh, April 9th, and uh, it's called a meeting to order. First on the agenda, I'm going to take a quick look at uh, some minutes from previous meetings. Uh, first, the minutes of March 26th. What am I missing? Oh, oh thank you. <coughs> Is there any public comment before we start? I have a brief one. Yes, excellent. <coughs> At the last meeting, there was discussion about snow plowing and manpower and how overworked people were. And the chairman, you, put something in there that just took something in my brain that said, we can always use the stormwater employees for snow plowing. Now, I was wondering how the financing of that works. Are stormwater employees exclusively stormwater? When they stop working on stormwater projects, do they get put into a different fund somehow? Yes, but I'll, how be, is the, I'll let Ned how explain is that. The, because how we is also the money going to go for this? You know, dur we, during the actual event, the snow event, we pull from the other departments, and Ned can explain how that works. That's correct. During regular daytime events, they're pulled from other departments. Once it goes into overtime, there is a snow and ice overtime account that's funded by the general fund where these employees get paid out of. So if they're doing snow clearing operations on a 7 to 3 shift, they're being paid out of each respective division or enterprise fund. That's just for overtime? No, that's straight time. Oh, during the daytime? Right. So on a weekends... Water, a water department employee... Is plowing snow, that's correct. With water enterprise funds water to plow price. snow during the daytime, that's correct. And how does that justify it? It's not directly related to... The city does not have the resources on the general fund side to take care of snow plowing across the city. And this is historically how it's been done. It just seems like there's no line in there. If the city would like to staff up another 20 or 30 people in the general fund division to do this work or hire contractors, it could be done that way. But isn't that just a bookkeeping thing? <coughs> in other words, if somebody is at the water department, they're being paid by the water department, you pull them out, they, they start plowing the streets, mm -hmm. and they're still paid by the water department? During their straight time shift only. Once it goes in overtime, it's paid out of the general fund. So, I mean, you could correct that with a bookkeeping change, no? Um, that could be done in the future. Do the residents know that their water bill is paying for street plowing? And the equipment's also being used to plow the streets, too. Correct. I mean, but do we have a dividing line in these, these enterprise funds? Not during the daytime shifts. Should be made known, I think. So, could we agree to talk about that? Make sure. a, a, a policy discussion at a future meeting? I'm not unsympathetic. Did, yes. We did talk about, we sort of uh, alluded to the fact that there wasn't perfect uh, assignment of time and time codes in general because of probably the um, additional uh, work for the staff to have. So I'm, I'm, so I'm just throwing it out that we did touch on it. So. But there's also the fact that the city got that $250 plus bonus by getting out of contributing to the stormwater enterprise fund. Right. All right, so we'll, we'll make this a, an agenda item. Any other public comment as opposed to the specific comments? All right. <coughs> now, uh, next are minutes of the March 26th BPW meeting. Second. <coughs> Any comments or corrections? Mm -hmm. All in favor of approving those minutes as, as it amended? Aye. Aye. Now we have a March 26th uh, public hearing up on what road was that? Uh, Bodging. No, no, this is uh, Ridgeview. 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 Ridgeview is the 26th. No approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then finally, the um, hearing on March 12th, which was by the head on. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. We're going to have a motion to take. <coughs> oh, it's no, next. next. The Bridge, Bridge Street Cemetery <laughs> fence. We have some residents from Ward 3 here to talk to us about this. <laughs> My name is Bob Reckman. I'm, I'm the president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association and the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development Committee. And 
as a result, that's not, I'm going to talk about the Wars and Neighbors Association tonight, because we all know the fence at Bridge Street Cemetery <coughs> is, a lot of it, in terrible condition. Um, the, the, uh, and we hope that we can gain your support to work with us to get CPA funding to replace some portions of that fence. Okay. Um, we begin by meeting with the CPA staff to talk about the project and the application process. We've reviewed it ourselves, but we have not talked to them. We would welcome DPW participation in that meeting. Uh, after that, our group, the DPW, BPW, and any other interested parties would begin identifying the types of fencing that might be appropriate for this to replace some, some of the fence at the cemetery. The DPW would then solicit informal proposals from suppliers to get rough figures on cost. Um, we have located two photos of the old fence, which I think you all got in your packets. I have them with me if you did not. Uh, but the old fence is certainly better looking than the current fence. We best if we could raise enough money to replace the entire fence. If that's not the case, there are three sections that could be replaced sequentially. The first is the portion on Bridge Street to the corner of Parsons, the bridge and then past the bus turnaround to that corner by Bridge Street School. Um, that's the most visible section of the fence, in part because <coughs> of Route 9 and in part because of the traffic to Bridge Street School. The second portion is the portion <coughs> of Parsons Street, which is particularly visually egregious because you look right down that fence and it just looks so bad. Okay. Uh, the last portion is North Street and Orchard Street, which are in, compared to the other two sections, way better condition. Um, we don't think that all, we think that the fence, the chain link fence that's behind the houses on Orchard Street and behind the house at the corner of Parsons and North should probably be left in place because it would be very, very difficult to replace it. Um, we know of some cemeteries that have no fences. They're mostly in rural settings. If it's your opinion the fence is necessary, only in some areas that would certainly cut down the cost. Oh. The cemetery edge could be marked by bollards with chains or a variety of ways, or bushes. There are a variety of ways to mark out borders between roadways, public ways, and cemeteries which are not fenced. <coughs> okay. We are sure that we can build substantial support in Ward 3 and the city as a whole for this project. Our team includes, the, 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 and I now know because we had our board meeting last night that we speak for the whole Ward 3 Neighbor Association board. Um, and the founder of North Street Association is also part of our little team. Okay, We've already spoken with the new director of historic <coughs> Northampton, who is understandably pleased with this initiative. Um, what are you together? And there are also many immediate families with people who were buried there who we think would be supportive. The, the neighbors, and you are, you are an immediate neighbor, Joan Russell, uh, would be interested as well. Adam Cohen is another one of those. We hope the Northampton Historic Commission would choose to be involved in whatever deliberations in supporting what we go through. It would also provide an opportunity to improve or change pedestrian and vehicle access to the cemetery if that worked for the DPW, because it's now very confusing. Okay. Um, there are also many graves whose stones are needed for repair. If the fence was better looking, it might be easier to raise money to repair the stones. And I took a walk through the cemetery with my geology class two weeks ago, and there are dozens and dozens of stones that are broken and fallen over. I'm sure you know that, but another way, if the fence would be the first step and the stone repair would be the second. We're just beginning to think about this project. Uh, we've solicited a budget estimate from Ameristar Fence for a three-foot-tall fence with rings. And I have a picture of that fence. It's a terrible picture. <laughs> and that fence would cost $90 a linear foot for materials only. And there's installation, and then there's removal of the existing fence. So it's going to be an expensive project. <coughs> um, and th that's just, I have no loyalty to that company. That's a fine, we want to have a quality fence. We know that. <coughs> but. We, the whole part of this process, point of this process, is to arrive at a consensus of what would be a durable and attractive fence for the cemetery. Um, so we need what we're here to ask is for your support in principle to work with us towards applying for CPA funding to replace the fence. 
Let me just say two other things. I know that you are looking, I expect, you've gotten CPA funding for Pulaski Park design. If I were you, I'd go back to CPA <coughs> for, for construction costs as much as they would give you. So that would be, to me, more important than, than this one. But happily enough, this is later in the queue. I, I also know that Bridge Street School just got a big CPA grant to rebuild their playground, which is a wonderful thing, but we, we Ward 3 is too long been neglected in the city. <laughs> I'm just kidding there. So we really hope that you will take a positive approach towards our application. Let me introduce the other people from our association who are here. Fred Zimnock is over there in the corner. You may know him from Stormwater. He's our treasurer. He used to be our treasurer. He will be. Will be He's not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Oh, I'm not yet. I didn't give him the paper. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Joan Rasul, who lives on North Street, and Miriam, Miriam who, lives, who lives on Lincoln Avenue. Right. So, and I don't, <coughs> I'd just like, like to have a sense of, for you of what you think about this proposal. We're, we're excited about it, and we're so pleased that the CPA can now spend those dollars on prior city-owned properties, which it opens up a whole range of <coughs> proper project, worthy projects, which can be undertaken. Okay. Jim? Uh, this is city-owned property, yes? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we're cemetery commissioners. Yeah. What's our title? Board of Public Works. Board of Public Works. Formerly known as the Cemetery Commissioners prior to 1960, but you are now the Board of Public Works. Okay. I just wanted to say I did review the proposal. I spoke with Bob on the phone. Um, pretty enthusiastic about it myself from a, kind of from a personal standpoint. Clearly having a nice decorative fence there that's a little more historical would be mm -hmm. a great thing for the cemetery. Um, when I read through the proposal, it seems like they're basically seeking board and department support in the preparation of the application, both in terms of determining sort of an appropriate type and cost of the fencing and, and the limits of the fencing in terms of um, trying to identify the budget. The CPA, I know this just from having been through the Pulaski Park thing, a lot of times they'll ask for options in terms of the cost, yeah. but can you do a portion of it? This is the type of project that would fit that sort of criteria pretty well because you could just determine which segments of fencing make the most sense. Um, so there were those sorts of issues. I, I talked to Richie about it because he knows a lot more about the cemetery than I do, and I don't know if he wants to have any, have any thoughts about it, but um, <coughs> it, does, it does seem like a great thing, and the level of support that they're asking for from us seem pretty reasonable. So. Fred, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, does I, I, maybe Rick could actually answer it, and, or maybe somebody here knows it, but what, what's the actual function of the fence? Why was the fence put up? I mean, is there any vandalism, perhaps? Uh, what's the reason for the fence? Uh, the fence was taken down probably about 50 or so years ago, and uh, for whatever reason, probably most likely because the original fence fell in disrepair. Yeah. Um, similar to the one that was at Park Street Cemetery, but the, the fence that's there now has really kept, unfortunately, uh, there has been vandalism. There hasn't been any recent vandalism, but at least once a year there's some kind of issue in there where the cops have to be called, and the police do go in there regularly. Um, and the other issue that has become prevalent is downtown's, um, uh, downtown has changed. There are, there are a lot of renters with pets, and they unfortunately use the cemetery as a place uh, to walk their dogs, and they, they you know do their business in there, which is inappropriate. So it was kept locked for many years because originally the cemetery rules stated that the cemeteries were only open from dawn till dusk, and so the gates were closed. That was changed probably in the early 2000s, late 90s, where the gates at, at that particular cemetery were, were kept open so people could come after hours to visit their loved ones that were buried there. So the purpose of the fence was for security. Uh, and for the original intent was, according to the rules and regulations, was to keep the cemetery locked after after dusk. <clears throat> so, so it does have some functionality. Yeah, it does have some functionality, and unfortunately, I think that the nature of uh, the open space in downtown is limited. So I think uh, probably for many years, I mean, I can remember Norman Menegat said that the section that's by or by North Street used to be a football field. Yeah. So they used to play sports in there at one time many years, many years ago before that was developed. Developed, but um, 
So that's so it does have a functionality. Yes. So hopefully this process will lead to a discussion of that issue in greater depth, and we may still agree that a fence needs to be there. But that's what I hope we this process will talk about that. Mike, did you have a comment? It seems to me if we don't keep the gates locked and it's only three feet high, then it's not a security feature at all. And but the fence that's there now is not three feet high. No, but I see. Okay. You can't get over that fence that's there now. Okay. How but the gates tall? are but the gates are not locked. Is that right? Five feet tall. Five, 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 five. Not not a short fence. Yeah. The gates are not locked. No, they're not locked. There's only one gate. There's only one entrance on Parsons Street. Yeah. yeah. Right. So ultimately, this may be more aesthetic than security, which is a fine reason to do it. It's just. You know, I think it does warrant more discussion about how we really want that property used. Well, would I be fair to say that we broadly support this and mm -hmm. would like to see this whole discussion move forward and we can assist with the any CPA um, application? It sounds great to me. Right. I think well, we appreciate your support, and I'll just be in touch with Jim. That's all we need to do. Would the Ward Free Association put the CBA application together, the grant application, with assistance from us? Is that what you think? I, I hadn't thought about that. Probably we should. Maybe. They don't Maybe. love public works as much as they love Ward Free. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but so that's another thing we we'll have to figure out as we go down this road together. But if we go down it together, we got a, that's when we got a sure. shot. Okay. I, it sounds great. Okay. So when is the next discussion? So I'm going to talk to Jim, and, we'll, and then we'll set up a meeting with our fence team and Jim and the CPC administrator. So the next round is in the fall, I think, right? Yeah, so we got to start the process. You've been down that road before, so you know. I one or two scars from that. <laughs> but look to tell the story. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. I'm safe. Uh, okay, next I'd like a motion to take the DPW budget out of order. Susan Wright is here to talk to us about uh, the methodology for um, assessing indirect charges to the enterprise funds, <coughs> particularly the administrative indirect. So today, um, BJ handed out a um, revised um, sheet, so the legal, we're going to talk from two different sheets. One is this legal size sheet, and then these other supplementary sheets um, kind of have some of the methodology. So I think what I'd like to do is just start with the first page of um, the legal sheets and just show you that this is a summary of the indirect charges to the enterprise funds as proposed for 2015. And each uh, fund is listed. Um, there's the sewer, water, solid waste, and now stormwater. So the total would be 2,110,221, which is a decrease over the previous year of 556,761. So the change is we've added a new enterprise fund Stormwater, and we've decreased it. So I'm going to go through um, the methodology that we use. Another big change that I want to point out on this bottom section where it says other indirect costs, you see lots of zeros. And up until, uh, well, up until FY15, there were a number of people that were 100% in the general funds, like Jim and Ned, Emery, DJ. Um, and we charge them back to the enterprise fund a portion of their time as part of the indirect. The big change that we, that's been made in the FY15 budget is that now when you see the budget, it's going to show Jim Lorela split up by a percentage of his salary in the general fund and then a percentage in sewer, water, et cetera. So we're going to directly charge some of the employees that provide oversight to these enterprise funds rather than do it through the indirect. So that kind of took care of one big category. And it's, a, it's really a wash when you, when you do the math because we used to get papered on the general fund side and then get reimbursed through the indirect. Now we're not going to pay for it on the general side, but we're not going to get reimbursed either. So 
That's one big change in this. But then we also changed and tightened up the methodology. Last year we made a, a first pass at trying to get the methodology for the indirects a little more accurate. I inherited the um, indirect methodology from my predecessor, Chris Pyle, who I don't believe changed it from the methodology that John Musanti um, did. So it had been a number of years since we'd updated it. So I felt that I needed to do some work on it last year, and the work that we started last year we've continued. So I think we've done a better job at quantifying what the general fund provides as support to the different enterprise funds. So I think what might make sense is to go through the methodology for the sewer fund, and then you'll see that that same methodology has been applied across the board for the other one. So if you turn the page, that the first um, fund we'll look at is, is the sewer enterprise fund. And when we tried to come up with ways to figure out what portion of various departments in the city provide support and what that support is. We tried to come up with metrics that would be different. Uh, the prior methodology was one straight percentage for this whole um, top category of city council all the way down to central services. It was just one percentage. So this time we really tried to look at and say what is the driver behind what this particular office provides for the enterprise fund. So we came up with a number of different metrics, so I'm going to go through those and explain how we came <coughs> up with those. The other thing that we did is um, we did consult with the Department of Revenue. The Department of Revenue came in last summer. They made it a summer project to send their field reps out to various towns to look at the methodology that communities were using for indirects because they decided that they really wanted to get this on their radar screen. So they're going to be issuing some guidelines. Um, and they did come in and they asked us to provide our methodology. They also did a study uh, for the city of Newburyport, which is on their website, and they actually went into Newburyport and helped Newburyport come up with a methodology. So some of the ideas we got to change our methodology came from that report, so we know that they kind of passed the DOR test. So the first category that we have is city council, and one of the main things in the city council budget is the audit for the city. The audit's about $40,000, and the audit includes the general fund, and it includes all of the enterprise funds. So that is the audit that um, Tom Scanlon, who's our, our independent auditor, does for us on a yearly basis. And at the next city council meeting, he's going to be presenting the audit from 2013. So it seems reasonable that the city council, who does passes your legislation, passes the orders to spend money, that we should ch charge some portion of city council. So what we did for this particular item is we took the percentage of the entire personnel services and OM for the city council, and we based it on a percentage of the budget um, that each one of the enterprise funds represents to the whole. But before doing that percentage, we took out the debt service, because that really was kind of inflating the amount. Um, we felt that that was better. So we took the debt service out of the general fund, we took it out of the three enterprise or four enterprise funds, and then uh, up took a straight percentage. So in this particular category, the sewer fund, and we based this on the prior fiscal year. So in this category, um, city council for sewer was 7.07%, and in water it's 4.35%. And if you flip through, you'll see for our solid waste, it was 1.5. And for the new stormwater, um, it's 1.87. And I based that on prior year, and all I did for that was take the percentage of stormwater and flood control for that year. So for the mayor's office... Um, so just a, a quick question before we leave city council. So this includes the city councilor's salary, the secretary's salary. Right. Uh, this includes the cost of the outside audit. And that's pretty much it. <coughs> yeah, the whole budget for city council is 104. Mm -hmm. And 40 of that, 40 or 45 of that's the audit. And then the city councilors each get 5,000 each or 5,500, I don't remember, times 10. Nine. say nine, there's nine, so. Um, and then the clerk is part-time, mm -hmm. okay. it's a half-time clerk. So for the mayor's office, 
we decided rather than take a percentage of the entire mayor's office, the, the, the what we felt was <coughs> fair is that really only the mayor and I deal with the enterprise fund. So we took the mayor and my salary, and then we figured two hours a week. So like one hour of the mayor's time and one hour of my time. So that's how we came up with that number. Um, the auditor's office. So two hours a week is? An hour a week. An hour of each. 10,000 out of the 170. All right. Right. So for the auditor's mm -hmm. office, if you turn to um, this other handout that you have, um, actually, if you turn to the second page of that, you'll see the calculations I did for the city council. That was the FY14 budget taking the debt, principal, and interest out, then an adjustment, and that's how I came up with the percentage. Oh, yeah, it's on the back. I'm oh, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, okay. So if you turn to the next page, I had the auditor do a number of different calculations for, for me. First, I had her do for FY13, because oh, the books are closed on FY13. I had her compare general fund revenue total and then revenue for sewer, water, and solid waste. And let me back up a minute. The auditor's office is probably, that and the collector and the treasurer are probably the offices that most heavily support the enterprise funds. The auditor's office basically runs all of the payroll. Uh, they do all of the accounts payable for the enterprise fund. They do all the bookkeeping for the enterprise fund. So I had her look at a, at a couple of different metrics. I had her look at the revenue that she has to track that comes in through the three enterprise funds as a percentage of the general fund. I had her look at gross payroll because she has to do the payroll um, for all of the uh, divisions. <coughs> I had her look at the OM as a percentage, just total dollar value. I then asked her to look at journal entries, which are basically the accounting entries that she has to make to balance the books, to do, to, to move monies around, etc. And so, in this particular instance, in FY13, there were 257 sets of journal entries, and she gave me the breakdown: how much was the general fund, and then how much was the various enterprise funds. And again, for stormwater, I used the stormwater division and flood control, just because I didn't have any prior year. I then asked her to look at invoices processed. And so in FY13, the city processed 21,668 invoices and had her break it down that way. So I took all these various percentages and I took a total and then I took the average. And that's how I came up with some metric to assign, say, you know, this enterprise fund takes 7% or 6 or 3% of the auditor's office. Are those metrics being reviewed every year? Or are they, it seems like an awful lot of work, which is great. I think these I, think these I would do because she said it's relatively easy yeah. for her to calculate. Sure, because it'll obviously those change from year to year. That's the problem with metrics. So right. It's easy to calculate and update it. Right, definitely. I wanted to do as many things as could be updated because things change. And so um, it, I think once we get into the mode of this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty routine. Okay, so that's. If you go back to the legal sheet, you can see the auditor's office, their entire budget is 263780 and so I used 7.09% for sewer, and then in water I used 7.08, in solid waste 3.95, and in the new storm water I used the 0.59. The assessor's office, we decided not to include that in, the, in our <coughs> review. I couldn't find anything really that the assessors did in, in any direct way to support the enterprise fund. So we took the assessor's office out of the calculation. The treasurer's office, I used the same uh, metrics that I used for the auditor's office because everything the auditor does flows to the treasurer's office. She runs a payroll warrant, he writes the checks. She runs a vendor warrant, he issues the checks. He has to track every dollar that she does because that's the check and balance. He keeps a set of books, she keeps a set of books, and those together are how we, how we cross-check and, and provide controls. So I use the same metrics um, for the treasurer's office. For the collector of taxes, if you flip the page, or turn it over, whichever, I actually got into the number of bills that they issue. 
So I asked the collector to provide some data on the number of bills. So she issues 12,326 real estate bills four times a year. So she issues about 49,000 bills. Excise is about 23,000 bills per year. And then Anne Marie Levy provided the number of water and sewer bills that are issued in a quarter, and we know stormwater is going to be on these bills, so it's not an additional bill. Um, and there's 8,490 8, times four, so that amounts to about 33,000. So I just took the total number of bills issued per, per year and did a percentage. And so out of that, 68% of the bills that the collector's office deals with are the real estate and excise or the general fund, and 31.96. So then I divided that by only three enterprise funds because the solid waste enterprise fund has no, has no bills. So I took the third, so I think it's reasonable to assume that about a third of the collector's office work relates to collecting these bills. I think it's actually a little bit more because each one of those bills requires a different entry because one has to be billed to water, one has to be billed to sewer. But I think this was a pretty easy and fair way way to do this. So we, that's how we came up with the collector's office. And I do want to point out the collector's office in the city budget also includes two staff in parking and some hefty parking OM operations. They have um, software, and I took those out of the number before I took that 33%. <coughs> so we took out the, collector, the collector's parking clerk and the uh, hearing officer, and then I took out um, a portion of the, the OM budget that related just to parking. They have like a $60,000 you know, fee for the parking you know, tickets. So, that. so we adjusted that number down. So Susan, the only thing that you're potentially missing here is the homeowners who don't get water and sewer bills and the additional bills that would be generated to them yeah. because of the separate bills. Right, okay. but I think I think they're pro it's probably small enough percentage. So for legal services, um, if you flip the page, <coughs> this one was this one was a little hard to get a handle on. Um, As opposed to the other one. Yeah. <laughs> I did ask Alan Seawald, our city solicitor, how much time he estimated he spent on the end of enterprise funds. And he said last year he probably about 5%. So our budget with um, his firm last year was 212000 so I took 5% of that. Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn is our labor council. And of course, the employees in the enterprise funds are part of collective bargaining. So we felt it was fair to include some portion of that. And you know, DBW has employees in AFSCME, they have them in Napia and in Maine, but we decided just to use one union because Maine is, is, is the biggest. Um, so we took one union out of seven. And so I figured of the 310000 we spent in FY13, I would attribute 24000 perhaps to the enterprise funds, or 7.9. And then I divided that by the three enterprise funds. So I did took the 7.95, divided it by 3, came up with 2.7, and then I added a 0.5 for solid waste just because there had to be something because the, the city solicitor does deal with some issues with solid waste. So if you go back to the um, legal sheet here, you can see the budget for FY15 for legal services is going to be 225. So for the sewer fund, I took 2.65%, so that's about $5,900. So... Moving on, for HR, HR, I felt the metric that best represented that was the number of employees because HR administers all the benefits for the city employees. So this is where there was some correction because um, that's why what you got at home and what you're getting today has been slightly corrected because I had a typo in one of the spreadsheets on the FTE. Oh, yeah. the FTEs, the, it's this sheet, oh, okay. um, this one. Oh. Um, I'm just a little confused. And you're doing such a wonderful job. I'm at least following you, so whatever. But um, on, I want to go back to legal Don't services. Don't know about the rest of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, I'm just saying it, it is it's a hard thing to say. The 2.7 percent is divided equally among the three enterprise funds. Actually, I took the 7.95. So, so divided by three, and then made 2.7 percent. Yes. 
and then plus for the solid waste. So if I add those two together, I get 3.2. So, so what I did on, on each one of these, I used, um, for legal, I used 2 point, it's actually 2.65. Right, percent. And, that's I was and then on solid okay. waste, I only used a half a percent. So if you look oh, at the oh, now I get it. Okay, so so if you yeah, look at the solid waste, there, yeah, got it. Yeah. It's okay, one thousand. Okay. So when you say you divided seven point two by three, do you mean each of the enterprise funds paid one third? One third. And not relative to their size. Right. Simply one, one third, third, one third, one third. One okay. third. Yes. So for. For HR, I used FTE. So the chart that you have in front of you is the total FTEs for the city. And you can see at the bottom, uh, the first column is 2013, then there's 2014, and then 2015. So we've had quite a jump um, in employees, and partially, mostly that's due to the school department. Smith Boat has um, increased their budget, and they have um, through tuitions, et cetera. So they've had some increases in staff, and so has uh, Northampton Public School. But anyways, the bottom line for FY15 is that there are 991 FTEs. And so what I just did is a simple percentage. So you can see the enterprise fund, the water enterprise fund has 22.96 FTEs, or they're 2.32%. The sewer has 20.95 FTEs or 2.11. Uh, solid waste has three FTEs, so they're 0.3 of a percent. And the new stormwater enterprise fund has 9.78 employees, so they are just about 1%. So for the HR department, I used the, the employees as the driver. Um, so if you look at, for instance, the sewer enterprise charge, the total HR budget is 222000 and the sewer is 2.11% of the employees, so we charge 2.11%. I think that this is pretty low because I think HR provides a lot more support, Just, but I think it's the fairest way to do it, I think, just based on the FTE because the HR also provides um, HR to the schools, and they are a big chunk of that. So. For MIS, uh, if you flip that page again where we were looking at some of the methodologies, <coughs> this one was really hard to get a handle on as well because um, nobody in MIS has really been tracking their time, or what, how much time they spend, and to them they come to the DBW. They don't know when they come to the DBW, is this the general fund, is this the sewer fund, so it was a little hard to get a handle. Um, Vanessa felt that her office um, probably provided 10 hours a week to the enterprise fund. So their staff, they're staffed 150 hours a week. They have four employees, two work 40 hours a week, two work 35 hours a week. So out of that 150 hours per week, the estimate from the director is about 10 hours per week spent on the en enterprise fund. So that would be about 6.67% of their total salary budget. So their budget in <coughs> FY15 for salaries is 206,000. 6.67% of that is 13,734. So then I just equally divided that by the four enterprise funds. So each enterprise fund is getting charged $30,434 for MIS support, which I think is, is pretty low. Well. Let me just ask, does, does it seem right that someone's here 10 hours a week? Well, not necessarily here, but they also do the immune server down at MIS, okay. which is our utility building. Sure. Okay. So then OM, the, the MIS budget has all of the OM in the operations and maintenance. They do telephones, they do internet, um, they do all of the fiber optics. So there's a portion of that that we needed to capture. Um, so we decided to use the metrics that we did for city council, which were kind of just based on budget size. So that's where we came up with those numbers. So I took the OM budget um, for FY15, which is 301,000, and then I took a percentage of that. So out of all four enterprise funds, the total being charged for MIS is 58,327. And that also includes the whole MUNIS license, so it's your whole accounting system, it's everything. So I thought that it was a much, it was a much better number, I think, um, to use. So 
Back to the legal sheet, we decided that we could find no rationale for charging the enterprise funds a portion of the city clerk and or central services. Central services is David Pomerantz who does all the facilities and everything. Um, we just couldn't find any rationale to, to charge any portion of that. So, so that's how we did the general fund. Um, the employee benefits were a little easier and more straightforward. Um, for medical and life, we took the same FTE we use because it's really hard. You don't never know during open enrollment who's going to sign up, who's not going to sign up. So we used it, the total of FTE because that's kind of like the potential liability that we have. So we use the same FTE uh, percentage for medical and life. Um, for workers' comp, if you turn the next page um, in the um, methodology, you'll see um, three different types of insurance, property, auto, and workers' comp. And Joe Cook is our uh, procurement and insurance officer. He works out of the auditor's office. So I asked him to do these calculations as to what portion of our bills for property insurance, auto insurance, and workers' comp related to the various holdings of the enterprise fund. So for workers' comp, we decided this was a better metric because when they come in and audit us, our workers' comp premium is actually based on the hazardness of the level of work. So we thought this was a better indicator because your employees are have more potential for workers' comp injuries than, say, office workers. So there's premiums. It's all very scientific and thought out, and actuaries do all that kind of stuff. So we just took the bill, which we get for workers' comp, which breaks it down by type of employee, and came up with these percentages. So um, as you can see, for workers' comp, the city is 16% of the bill. The school department's 48% of the bill. And then there's the water sewer landfill and again for stormwater enterprise I use the employees that were in stormwater and there's no employees in flood control. So that's how we came up with that percentage. Our workers comp insurance for FY15 is 230,000 so we took a percentage of that um, so it's based on the premium that relates to the actual workers. Um, and if you just skip down to the next category, you can see the same for property insurance and for vehicle insurance. I used those same uh, calculations that were done by uh, Joe Cook. So for instance, under property, sewer is 17% of our bill. So I used 17% of our property insurance. And we did the same kind of methodology for auto. So these are things that are very measurable and they're something that I can get every year pretty easily. So if you turn the next page in this in this smaller handout, I asked um, David Chipka, our retirement board administrator, to do this. And of course, he has to do it on the previous fiscal year. But the retirement assessment, we definitely wanted to do it by not FTEs. We wanted to do it by wages earned. Because if we did it by FTEs, the enterprise funds would take a higher percentage than they should because police and fire make more than DPW workers. So we wanted to do this by actual payroll dollars because that's what drives the retirement assessment. So David gave me the regular compensation, not the overtime paid, and broke it out by these various entities. And this is actually helpful because we do a, the same kind of calculations on the school side. I have to do an indirect calculation for the schools. It's not the same exact methodology, but I need a lot of these numbers anyway, um, because we have to show the Department of Revenue, excuse me, the Department of Ed, how much we contribute to the schools that doesn't show up in the school budget. <coughs> so this is an exercise that we do for that as well. So this is helpful for me to have that. And so he breaks down the salary, so you can see um, sewer, uh, which was stormwater, um, Division 30, uh, location 33 was 257,000, and wastewater treatment, and of course the city is 14.2 million. If you're wondering why the schools look so low, the teachers are not in the Northampton retirement system, and they're in the Mass Teacher Retirement System. So that's another reason we wouldn't want to do this by FTEs because the teachers have to come right out of this calculation because their their retirement in a totally separate. So that's how we came up with the percentages for the various enterprise funds for the retirement. And it's a really 
hefty um, bill. It's 4.7 million, so um, a small amount is actually comes up to a fairly large number. For employee taxes, uh, this is the next page in the methodology. I t I do a chart which I do the total payroll for the city, and this is based on the FY15 budget. So I take the total payroll for the city and the schools, and I subtract out the payroll for the Northampton Public Schools and Smith Vocational, and that leaves 20, a payroll of 20 million 730. And then I added all that up and assigned the percentage. So we take, we skim off the schools, and then we just figure out payroll-wise. Because payroll taxes are based on what people earn. So that one wouldn't, it's more appropriate to do that by the actual dollars. And this is basically Medicare um, in, on, on employees. And then other employee benefits, what that is, that $180,000, that's payouts. Um, so when an employee in the sewer or water or any department of the city retires, they are eligible if they've been here a certain number of years for a um, sick leave buyout. Um, most of the em newer employees are capped at 5,500, but we still have a lot of employees that were grandfathered at higher rates. So when they get paid out, it doesn't come out of the enterprise bu budget. It comes out of this line item. Um, depending, even schools come out of this line item. So also, if a person has comp time, we pay that out of here. So this is what other employee benefits. Yes. So the 2.36% the for employee taxes and other employee benefits calculated the same way and it, it yes. comes from the sheet labeled percentage for unemployment? Uh, Is that how you got there? I don't, I don't quite know, see how you I got there. I don't think that one I used the percentage for Oh, this is for unemployment. I should be referencing the previous page. Oh, I know what it is. Employee taxes, we have to go back to your percentage of the total payroll, and I can't strip the teachers out because we pay Medicare on the teachers. So that is on... Go so back to the very first. Yeah. This this page here is the print is like incredibly small and unreadable. But this is the total percentage for Medicare. Um, so let me walk you through this sheet. This sheet is the FY15 budget, all of the salaries by department. It actually has a by collective bargaining unit too. But if you get to the bottom, you'll see total with schools is 48,407. And then up above, you'll see the enterprise fund. So water operations and water treatment are 1.9 plus 0.58. So this 2.36 should be the one, the next category is water, uh, excuse me, sewer operations and sewage treatment plant. So the 1.57 plus the 0.79 are the 2.36. Mm. So but basically, this is the, the good correct save. number. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that number but basically, Susan, this is just it's the correct number for that payroll. Right, it is. <laughs> it is because Medicare, we pay the school. We have to pay the teachers uh, Medicare. So that's why I had to go back to that one. And then that employee benefits as well. Okay, so then unemployment is that sheet that we started looking at, which really should be that one. And unemployment. And again, unemployment is based on wages as well because the employee's liability for unemployment. Liability insurance, um, I took that on total payroll because again, liability insurance is, is driven by employees. So I did that one by that percentage. And then I'm going to skip over pilot just to do ESCO savings to bond debt service. If you turn to the last page of this handout, you'll see the ESCO. This was the um, 
this was the big six point five million dollar energy project that we did and there were projects done all across the city. The original way that we were going to pay for this is each department was going to pay based on their savings. Um, when I went to get the tax rate set the first year after this, um, the DOR just threw out that whole methodology for various reasons, which I totally agree with because I didn't develop the methodology. <laughs> but it, it just wasn't going to work. So what we decided to do is go back to the actual debt service. So I had David Pomerantz um, take the total of that whole contract with Con Ed, which was $6.5 million, and he basically broke it down by department. So the shaded in area is the, is the projects that were done at the various um, enterprise fund holdings. So the water treatment plant, we spent a total of 78,251. For the leachate, we spent 38,102. And for the wastewater treatment plant, we spent 650,000. So the bulk of it was spent there. So basically, I calculated the percentage, and then I take the percentage of the debt service. So up at the top, the bond payment for this $6.5 million in FY16 is $566,000. We have rebates that we got from the from um, Berk, uh, I want to say Bay State Gas um, that we're applying before we do this <coughs> percentage calculation. So in FY15, I have $100,000 of rebates. We got like $600,000 in rebates, so we're using a portion of that every year for at least three more years. So then that drops it down to 466, and then I simply take a percentage of that. So the enterprise, uh, the sewer enterprise fund, um, is going to pay the uh, the 51, and then the 3,000 above it. So that's where you get the 54, 70, 790, that 51, 758 plus the 3,000 from the <coughs> leachate. So that's where that number comes from. And when you look at the water enterprise fund indirect, you'll see. So this is based on the actual contract uh, that was expended? Right. And bonded, not the original contract, but I know some of the work did not get done. Some of the work didn't get done, um, but some of it got divided up in other places. Okay. So, so then, payment in lieu of taxes. Um, if you flip to the next page of your legal side one, I'm going to talk about what was the old methodology. And I'm, I wasn't here when this was developed, um, so I can't really give you much background. But how the methodology was applied was somewhere along the way, a value on the wastewater treatment plant was placed of, of about $49.5 million. And then the factor that increased it was the overall valuation of the city. So if the city's valuations went up, that value went up. If they went down, it went down. So in FY14, the value is, six, under this methodology, is 69972 So had we done this pilot payment the way that it had been done, if you look over on the left of your paper, you see we would have taken the 69 million, 69.9 million and times it by 95%. And I was told that that's because city values have to be within 95% of the market value. So then that amount was divided by 1,000, and then that was times the tax rate, which is 1539 for the current fiscal year. And then, so that comes to one million twenty-three thousand, and then seventy-five percent of that was considered the pilot. So, had we done this the same way for fifteen, the pilot would be seven hundred and sixty-seven thousand. Uh, the mayor, in discussions with um, Ned, uh, can't, we are putting in our budget for FY fifteen the money to do an appraisal on the on the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so that we can get an accurate value on the property. In the interim, because it, we can't have an appraisal done in time to get the whole budget in place, what we agreed to do is hold the valuation at 13, at 13 valuation and decrease it by 10%. So under that calculation, the pilot 
we use 69,292, which is the previous year's amount, times the 95 divided by 1,000, and times the tax rate, and times 65% instead of 75%. So it reduced it from what it would have been by 108,000. And for FY16 and beyond, we want to base it on, a, on an appraisal and then perhaps a five-year phase out. Um, there's just no way the city could absorb a gigantic um, decrease in that all in one year, but we recognize that we need to make this number more realistic. So we put money in the budget. Um, it'll be in the assessor's budget. Um, for the so that's how the pilot number is derived. So from. Susan, just to make sure I got this, you're saying we're going to bring it down to the assessed valuation, or we're going to bring it down and then beyond that, phase it out over five more years. Say that again? Or will you take five years to get from where we are now down to an assessed valuation, which is presumably lower? Or are we going to phase it out? I think, no, I don't believe, I, I can't speak for the man, but I don't believe the intent is to phase it out completely. Um, if you look at the Newburyport study, um, it's interesting. The DOR kind of looks at pilots in an interesting way. They feel that the community, if the enterprise funds are not charging the community for water and sewer services, then the community shouldn't be charging for the pilot. But if the community is paying water and sewer like all other customers, then there is a basis for a pilot. And we pay water and sewer, and we're going to pay a stormwater fee. So there is a basis for a pilot. Um, so I think that's the intent. Um, but again, I can't speak for the mayor. But this is a stopgap for FY16, and I think we're all in agreement that the value on that building needs to be determined. So what you were saying a moment ago is that if the new appraised value is, say, $500,000, <coughs> that you would take five years to go from 650 ish down to 500 I think once we know the number, we'll know what we can, what right. we, how we can work with it. I mean, if it was a hundred thousand, I don't yeah. think we'd take five years. I understand. So, and then because the city does not pay for sewer fees. No, the city does. We pay. The city is charged water <coughs> and sewer, mm -hmm. and we will be charged stormwater. Mm -hmm. So, the issue is we don't have an accurate appraisal for the building, so the, the sixty-nine million dollar mm -hmm. number. And the basis for that, I think, is in question, which is why the appraisal would be done and give a more solid basis for determining what the pilot should be. Pilots are pretty common in enterprise funds. The DOR has just been never given much guidance about what kind of methodology they want us to use. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things we're waiting for the Department of Revenue to come out with is some methodology because it is very nebulous. How, how do you value something that is exempt? You know, it's very, it's very difficult. So. And why is it a 75% or 65%? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. So do hopefully, and, and will the staff have a chance to participate in the um, appraisal? I would think the staff's going to need to provide the appraisal with a lot of information. Yeah. So. Okay, great. So the, the, the hopefully they'll set the basis for further discussion. Right. Okay. Right. So the other, if you, if you flip the page of the legal sheet, you can see all the same methodologies were used across the board. So um, except, you know, wherever the percentages needed to change, you can reference the other things. Um, if you look at the water enterprise fund, um, last year it was 855000 in FY15, it's dropping to 568, in part because we changed how we're doing, you know, the NEDs and the gyms and, and everything. And, um, and you can see, you know, the change. Last year, you can see in 2014, general government was 115,000, and in 2015, it's dropped to 100,000. Um, benefits went from 384 last year to 373, so those are pretty close. And then the bottom half is all different because of how we, we did the employees. Um, the pilot, I do want to point out the pilot for the water. Um, we did not change the methodology, we used the uh, same methodology, but I think when we do this appraisal, we'll be, we may be talking about doing the appraisal on, on all the properties, because it just seems like if we're going to do this right, let's just do it. 
So, so the water property would be the wells on Park <coughs> Street and the right. uh, corrosion control building. Watershed land. We own a lot of land. Uh -oh. So that would be a little, probably a little trickier than just the wastewater plant if you're going to look at all the parcels owned by the mm -hmm. water department. <coughs> Resident or protected status and would qualify normally for a reduced tax rate, like right. a chapter 61 parcel, something of that nature. I mean, I think this is going to be a conversation that the, that your board will be having with the mayor. Okay. So I'm not really here to speak on that, but I think it should, you know, the, the upshot is the mayor is interested in making this more accurate. So then the next one is solid waste. Um, and when I applied the same methodology, the solid waste actually has gone up a little. It was 97,000 last year. It's gone up to 102. Um, it wasn't a big enough difference, but I felt like we should change the methodology just for this one fund. And I think we know we're going to continue to have conversations about whether this enterprise fund is going to actually continue anyway. So we figured for one more year, we're just going to keep the same methodology. And then lastly, if you turn to the Stormwater Enterprise Fund, you'll see um, how that ends up playing out. And again, next year this will change because we'll do all those calculations over again. Um, but for this year, it comes up to 243000 So that's pretty much it. So it's a lot of number crunching, but I think like I said, because I need some of these numbers for other things that I have to do, it's not really that burdensome. Well, I think you did an excellent job with this. And, uh, thank you for all your time you put into this, Susan. Well, I think uh, I'd like to thank Anne Marie Levy, too, because she's uh, very helpful. So she's helpful in getting some of this stuff together. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Any questions? On the very first page, yep. um, in the column that deals with the change between FY14 and FY15, if you go down to the uh, bottom, it, there's a reduction of 556,000. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at um, the other direct costs, most of that's 516, which, which just means that those labor costs are, are now applied directly to each budget. So the so it's not I guess it, it's not like in total we have a reduction of five hundred and fifty six thousand dollars. It's just that a lot of that money, five hundred and sixteen of it, sort of went into the budgets other ways. Well I think too we we've, we've opened up a new enterprise fund. So we have a whole new category of employees that were paid for in the general fund. So their benefits were in the general fund. So now it's coming over there. So I think to make a real comparison, you'd look at just sewer, water, and solid waste and compare that number to last year. So I would t almost take out that 243, add these three numbers, and then compare it to this. Because this, uh, for FY14, this 266 was only for these three funds. 